स्नैक कर लिया Dear friends, very good afternoon and welcome to the United Nations premises. I am Subhinay Gandhi, United Nations Resident Coordinator in Sri Lanka, and we are very happy to host Mr. Jeff Department, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Head of the Department of Political Affairs, who is visiting Sri Lanka as an envoy of the Secretary General and engaging with different partners here and is visiting. So we are very pleased to present Mr. Frank Feldman here. We will be just uh, before we start, we will be here for about half an hour. So Mr. Stephen Feldman will make his statement and then we'll open for question and answers for, for from from the floor. Mr. Feldman over to you. Over the past four days, I've had a series of positive, constructive discussions here in Sri Lanka. Secretary General of the United Nations asked me to visit at what he sees as a moment of historic opportunity for the people of this beautiful country. Your democratic elections and peaceful transition have not only inspired the citizens of Sri Lanka, but also capture the attention of Sri Lanka's many friends in the international community. I want to thank the government of Sri Lanka sincerely for its generous hospitality in helping to arrange my visit on relatively short notice. While here, I had the opportunity to meet President Michael Policy Arsina, Prime Minister Renil Victor Batsenge, Acting Foreign Minister Ajit Guerrero, the leadership of the JHU, SLMC, TNA, and the diplomatic community. Yesterday, in Jaffna, I met with the governor and the chief minister of the Northern Central Council. In addition, I was able to listen to and compare notes with a divergent group of civil society representatives, both here in Colombo and in Jaffna. Those I met over the past four days inspired me with their visions for a prosperous, democratic country at peace internally and with positive, close, mutually beneficial relations regionally and internationally. Ladies and gentlemen, 2015 marks the 70th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations. We are also approaching the 60th anniversary of when Sri Lanka's first permanent representative to the UN, Sir Senarat Gunawardene, presented his credentials. In the years since then, Sri Lanka has made many important contributions to, to the organization. I am thinking of the, of the leadership roles that many prominent personalities from Sri Lanka have played in the UN. People such as Justice, Justice Christopher Baramante, Jayanta Danapala, Radhika Kumaraswamy, Andrew Joseph, and Shirley Amarasinghe. The current governor of the Northern Provincial Council represented your country with distinction in New York during a particularly challenging time. Thousands of Sri Lankan citizens over the decades have contributed to UN peacekeeping efforts including those currently deployed to important missions in Haiti, South Sudan, and the Central African Republic. The Secretary General believes strongly that we now have the opportunity to build on this existing foundation to renew and strengthen the partnership between Sri Lanka and the United Nations and between Sri Lanka and the international community. We in the United Nations recognize that Sri Lankans from across the country suffered during the long conflict. No community was immune. And despite work of many commissions, the list of grievances and unresolved issues remains long. 
as demonstrated by the speech of the Honorable Minister of Foreign Affairs before the Human Rights Council in Geneva yesterday. We are encouraged by this government's commitment to promote reconciliation, accountability, and human rights. This is very much in line with the 2009 joint communique issued on the occasion of the UN Secretary General's visit to Sri Lanka soon after the end of the conflict. In our view, credible, tangible progress in these areas is a prerequisite to the achievement of sustainable peace and prosperity in Sri Lanka. In that spirit, I have urged government leaders to take steps in the short term to address issues regarding land, detentions, disappearances, and the military posture in civilian areas. Over the longer term, I have underscored in my meetings the expectations by the United Nations and by the international community that the government will, as it has promised, develop in the coming months a strong framework for accountability that meets international standards and norms and that is seen as credible across Sri Lanka. These are not easy tasks, but we believe that they are essential tasks, expected by the international community and also, more importantly, by the citizens of this country themselves. Without question, there is still a wide trust deficit between communities in Sri Lanka, especially between the Tamil and the Sinhalese. We have thus encouraged the national leaders and political stakeholders to work on all of these issues in the spirit of inclusion and consultation. Inclusion requires that all communities be willing to participate in these processes. As requested by Sri Lanka, the United Nations is committed to assisting in the process of accountability and reconciliation through the Peace Building Fund and other facilities as appropriate. But it's first and foremost for Sri Lankans themselves to shape how to address issues of the past in order to find a common future. With regional allies and the world focused in a positive way on Sri Lanka, and with the citizens of Sri Lanka having drawn from Sri Lanka's strong democratic history and traditions to promote a peaceful transition, this is a historic moment to seize. I know that the Secretary General himself and the United Nations system more broadly will stand with the people and leaders of Sri Lanka as they address credibly and thoroughly the accountability and reconciliation issues that, once resolved, will contribute to Sri Lanka's long-term peace and prosperity. In this 70th anniversary of the UN's founding and the 60th year of Sri Lanka's membership of the UN, we welcome the promise of renewed partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Captain. Uh, colleagues, uh, we will open the floor for <coughs> questions. May I request that uh, if you could introduce your name and the agency you represent. I'm also pleased to know that if any of the journalists here would need to speak in Tamil or Sinhala, please feel free to do so, and our staff will have a translation. Who wants to go first?
Right now, there's uh, a boycott, and there's a call for boycott of hearing for the Disability Commission. How, um, how successful do you think an internal mechanism would be when there are um, campaigns such as these based on what they say are failures in the past, the past of the So, you I'm David from the TV. So my question is that I'm going to remember how Queensside, uh, when human rights has said that at the next session, the report on Sri Lanka will be published. So is this report going to be the same report that was to be published at this session, or is it going to be somewhat different? Thanks very much for your questions. My message to the Secretary General to answer the, to answer the first question will have, several, will have several parts. One is to reinforce his own sense that now is a real opportunity for the government in Sri Lanka and for the United Nations as a whole to refresh and renew the partnership. That we do have um, a strong foundation on which to build a long history of Sri Lanka's membership in the UN and contribution to the organization, but now it's time to take the relationship to, and partnership to, to a new level. So that's, that's one message. Another message is to you know, repeat something I said in my statement. There is a trust deficit here, and the trust deficit um, needs to be overcome by the people of Sri Lanka them, themselves in order to have successful accountability and reconciliation in this country, which we see as essential uh, in, in the post-conflict environment. And to note that there may be areas where we can provide um, expert advice, assistance, etc., if requested by Sri Lanka and, that, and as appropriate. So those are the sorts of messages. There's, opportunity, there's opportunities here, but the challenges um, do remain uh, great. In terms of the domestic processes, let me note that the UN is an organization that's made up of member states. When member states sign on to the Charter of the United Nations, as Sri Lanka did 60, 60 years ago, they assume certain obligations. Member states assume other obligations in signing on to the various conventions, human rights conventions, um, the Universal Declaration, things like that. So, in general, the United Nations expects member states themselves to handle domestic issues in a way that is consistent with the international standards and norms to which the member states have agreed to be part of this organization. So the, the important point when it comes to a domestic process on accountability is that, that domestic process is credible. What makes the domestic process credible in the UN's eyes is, is it living up to the international standards and norms that are embodied in the various UN um, documents to which a, a member state has signed on to. The government here has assured us at many levels that they will live up to their international obligations, they will meet international standards, that they can have a domestic process that meets those international, those international standards. Obviously, a domestic process needs to be seen as credible by the people most affected, by the people of Sri Lanka in this case. And, and all communities um, in Sri Lanka suffered during the conflict. And of course, there's, there, there's particular interest on the Tamil side to make sure that the processes are credible. We have, we have offered assistance. We're in constant dialogue with the government about ways that the process, a domestic process, can be made credible to meet international standards. The Foreign Minister yesterday met with the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. I, of course, had a series of meetings here, much of which was, much of which was our encouragement of coming up with, with um, a domestic process that would be seen as credible, that does live up to international standards. That's the basic point. In, oh, the um, as the as the Human Rights Commissioner himself said when he recommended the Human Rights Council that in response to the discussions, ongoing discussions with the government, that the, that the release of the report be delayed, 
he made clear it's a one-time deferral. Mm -hmm. A one-time deferral. If there's ways to enhance the findings in the report between now and September, we would look for ways to actually improve the findings. But the basic report, the basic findings, the basic um, documentation that report will be, will be released um, by the time the Human Rights Council meets again in September. Okay, one, two, three. So we'll come back the next time, please. No, excuse me, can I pass the mic to you? We'll come back. Okay. I'm Shaman Bhargavi, I work for the Asian Council. Well, actually, in from your answer, I just want to have a question. Does it mean a blood donation would uh, support a credible domestic process with international standards? Yes, or no? I'm Lassen Jahr from the Union Nationalism. Mr. Feldman uh, mentioned uh, regarding the report. Regarding the, the report, you said you, you may enhance it uh, and we'll try to improve it. My question is regarding your discussions with the, when you visited the North yesterday. Uh, the Northern Provincial Council has passed a resolution on, on genocide. Uh, will, will that, uh, was that factored in the coming discussion and will that be factored into the, the delayed report? Can you remove? I just want to check with you, you mentioned about trust deficit. Uh, from what you understand, it might have an act. Yeah, please, sir. Amal Jaisinga from France Press. You did mention about trust deficit earlier, and uh, we understand that it's actually a trust deficit between the government and the UN organizations as well. So with the new administration, is there any effort to get some of the UN investigators uh, to have access to Sri Lanka? Uh, is, uh, is there any move? to actually get those uh, people involved in inquiry uh, to have a hands-on or just take some field visits and uh, see for themselves. Thank you. The first question is quite easy. Yes, the UN supports a credible domestic process that meets international standards. All parts of that are important. Credible international standards are the qualifiers for the domestic process that, that, we would, that we would support. But that's that's not unique to Sri Lanka. That's the case in in issues across the world that, that we would expect um, member states themselves to establish processes to address whatever the political issues are, issues in post-conflict environments that would meet international standards and be credible um, in the eyes of the international community, but more importantly in the eyes of the citizens of the country question itself. Um, on the on the OHCHR re report, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights report on Sri Lanka, I really need to, def to defer technical questions of that to your colleague from Geneva because it's not a report that we in the Department of Political Affairs, this is a, a report that was prepared um, in, in Geneva. Um, but what I can say is that the, the deferral of that report well, disappointing to some, and I heard I heard the disappointment, the expression of disappointment myself in talking in talking to people over the past four days in some quarters, allows time for the development of that credible domestic process, a framework for that credible domestic process that would meet internet, international standards. It was done in response to ongoing discussions between the, the government and the United Nations at, at many levels about how that process might unfold, how that process might develop. Um, and as I said before, we're willing ourselves to offer any support as requested and as, and as appropriate. Um, and it leads to the, the third question that was asked, which is a reference to a trust deficit between the, the United Nations itself and the, and the government. What I can say is that we have now an ongoing discussion. I've been able to discuss openly here with government leaders 
our own expectations for how the domestic process will work. The foreign minister was in Geneva yesterday, and I would I would encourage you to read the statement made by the by the honourable foreign minister of Sri Lanka before the Human Rights Council yesterday. He made it clear in that statement that special rapporteurs from the United Nations, for example, will be welcome to come to come to Sri Lanka. So I would rather than put words. In the, in the mouth of the government officials here, I would encourage you to look at what he himself said, the commitment he made to the members of the Human Rights Council yesterday. <coughs> just a supplement, I was talking about specifically investigators, not, not just the rapporteurs, but uh, specific investigators who were probably denied access before. There's, there is, again, there's ongoing discussions that we see as positive and constructive between how the UN and how the government of Sri Lanka can look at this whole range of issues.
to develop a federal mechanism. How will the government use that time between now and September? Like, so I think that there will be a, a rather bright spotlight shine on the government's efforts from September. In terms of the LHCHR report, in terms of investigation of human rights practices, I, I apologize, but I really do need to defer that to um, our colleagues in the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva to better address the answer, answer those, those questions. And in terms of, of how will the UN evaluate the domestic processes here, it's what I've been trying to say all along. It's will they live up to international standards as embodied by international practices in other, in other post-conflict situations and as embodied by the, the human rights conventions, the other um, documents of the, of the United Nations. I'm from the Island newspaper. How much time do you think the government would be given to complete this domestic court? the independent domestic court that the government has agreed to conduct. How much time do you think it will be given to complete? So that is from Reuters. Uh, in your statement, you say, uh, I have urged the government leaders to take steps in short term to address uh, regarding land, uh, etc., and then you say uh, military posture in Syrian area. Uh, does that mean uh, demilitarization? Do you, do you want to use demilitarization? And then in the long term, you have asked something, but you say it's a few months. So could you elaborate on the time frame uh, and uh, differentiate between the short term and long term in, in your frame? Thank you. short-term steps were 
a signal, I think, that we recognize the trust deficit here. And there, there's, I don't think it will surprise any of you because when I was in Japan yesterday, I heard great skepticism from people in the North about would some of these um, words really translate into tangible steps that would affect their lives. So we were encouraging the government, consistent with the government's own messages, to find short-term steps that can start addressing the trust deficit, that can start overcoming the skepticism that nothing has, that nothing has really changed. And there, there were a number of issues that, that were on the table that, that we that we suggested, but these are decisions for the government, for the people, for the for the leaders of Sri Lanka to make, but not something for the UN to take. Ours were ours were mere suggestions, but one area was the idea of trying to trying to um, minimize the impact of military deployments on civilian life. Was the, was the specific reference you you talked about? And the few months reference I think is pretty clear, which is the government is is going to be reporting something to the Human Rights Council in September. That's a few months from now. Thank you. We, are, we can probably take another two or three there is there and one doing. Okay. And one last question, please, as we finish it on time. Okay, that will be the last from BBC Ministers, do you see a change in the image of the UN after this new Shilapan government that the not Shilapan policy? I need to ask you. Um, <laughs> if you see the difference in the, in the UN. What I can say is from the UN's, per, the UN's perspective, um, we really see an opportunity here. Uh, the UN has been involved in Sri Lanka for many, many decades. The, the country team that, that um, it's working here with our with our resident coordinator. It's working in a number of development of humanitarian and other areas across the country. That work has has, has continued um, you know, for decades, and those agencies funding the programs will continue to be partners with the people and leaders of Sri Lanka and building a building a prosperous future for the people of, of Sri Lanka. Um, where I see the opportunity is now is, is for the UN, if requested, um, as appropriate, to also provide some help, advice, on those issues of accountability and reconciliation. There's a lot of unfinished business since the conflict ended in 2009. There's a, there are a lot of expe expectations by various parts of, the, parts of the population. And now is a time for the people and leaders of Sri Lanka to finish that unfinished business from the from the end of the conflict. And we're more than willing to work in the spirit of a partnership with full respect of the, of the sovereignty of, of Sri Lanka, full respect of the goal of a, of a unified, democratic, prosperous Sri Lanka to try to help Finish that business. Thank you. Dear yeah, friends, uh, we, the Commission will be closer to, to this dialogue here, and, and President uh, will be making Tamil translation and, and similar translation available. Hopefully, by tomorrow morning, they will be available on our, on our website. In the meantime, we have the English version, so you can use that one. But uh, let me thank on behalf of the whole team and you all for making it to this. Thank you.